Hi, you all. My Kim 116 students. So this video uh, is going to be for Tuesday, July 7th. I started talking about kinetics, the reaction rate, the average reaction rate, the instantaneous reaction rate, and the relative reaction rate, right, in the last lecture. For this lecture, I'm going to just, uh, rather than creating two separate videos, which are about 40, 45 minutes long, I'm just going to create one video, which is going to be anywhere from one hour, 20 minutes to one hour, 30 minutes long, depending upon how long it takes me to go through a problem. So let's start where we left off in the next last class. Right, so this is where I ended up with. I spent about almost five to six minutes on this on these factors that affected reaction rates. So we talked about how the concentration of reactants, the temperature and the pressure in the reaction vessel, the surface area of the reactants, and then the catalyst, how they affect the speed of a reaction. Right, whether it's slow or it's going to be fast, and that's what we've been defining as reaction rate. Right, and again, just I review, remember the way we are defining reaction rate is how the concentration of a reactant or a product is changing over time. Right, so change in concentration over change in time that's our reaction rate, right? And then the unit for concentration in the one that we've been using for this concept in kinetics have been molarity, which is the same as moles per liter and time. It can be second hours, doesn't matter, depending on what the question asks you. That's the unit for reaction rate, right? Molarity per liters times second, that's on the form of Molarity per second, these two are the same thing. And you might have seen Alex write it as moles liter negative one times second to the power negative one. And that's also acceptable, right? That is also equivalent because this is the same as one over liter. This is the same as one over second. And then I ended up talking about this multi three and then talking about this problem, right? We spend about four to six minutes working through this problem and saw as to how the volume of the reaction vessel, right? And then the temperature at which the reaction is carried out affect the rate of the reaction. All right, now moving on. All right, so now the next thing that we're going to talk about is something called rate law or rate equations. And then the integrated rate laws for the first order and second order reaction. Again, right now the name seems might seem foreign to you, but then as I explain these terms, I'm hoping you'll grasp the concept as to what these terminologies mean. So what is rate law? So basically all Rate law is a rate equation. These two are used interchangeably. It is a mathematical expression that describes the relationship between the rate of a chemical reaction, the rate of the chemical reaction, and then the concentration of its reactants, and then the concentration of the reactants. All right, so for this reaction A plus B, the reaction to give a product C, A and B, are the reactants. So in this mathematical expression, what I'm doing is I'm relating this rate of that chemical reaction with the concentration of the reactants. That's it. That's all rate law is. Now something you should have seen, most of the time rate law is written this way, rate equals to 
something which is called the rate constant so keep that in mind and we'll talk about rate constant in a little bit but k small k means rate constant in a couple of slides we're going to talk about how the rate constant does not have a fixed unit it depends upon whether it is first order second order third order reaction and such right now what are these exponents m and n that you see here then so these m and n first thing to keep in mind really, really important it has nothing to do with the value of m and n has nothing to do with the coefficient in front of the reaction so let's say this reaction was balanced and then i got something like 2a plus 1b gave me let's say 3c for right now so let's imagine a reaction now these coefficients in front of the reactant has nothing to do with this value of m and n so keep that in mind really, really important point all right now this m and n values and the rate constant values they can be derived through experiments and in a couple of slides we're going to see what is the method chemistry use to derive the value of m and n and then the rate constant all right so basically what m and n are called they are called the reaction order The name sounds fancy, all right? But what it just means is basically, first thing, just to make sure you understand, M and I N are going to be generally numbers, not generally, always numbers. Sometimes they can be fractions as well, not necessarily whole numbers, but you don't have to worry about those fractional M and N values for K-160, for summer course anyways, all right? So what do reaction order tell you is it describe the effects of these reactants on the rate. That's what M and N describe you. All right, so now let's keep talking about M and N. So like I told you, this, all these values, rate constant, the reaction order, they are determined experimentally. In a couple of slides, we're gonna see how do chemists derive this experimentally, and we're gonna spend some time working on a problem where it explicitly asks you to find the value of k, m, and n. So first thing, the rate constant k, it is independent on the concentration of a and b. So the rate, we, we're going to talk about uh, in towards the end of this chapter, something called RNS equation. That is where we're going to learn as to what is k dependent on. Uh, now let's talk about those m and n and what does it mean by reaction order so the way we think about reaction order is basically depending upon the values of m or n we say whether the reaction is either first order second order or third order and so on all right so let's say in our earlier example where i had the rate of the reaction as k concentration of a to the power m and concentration of b sorry to the power n so all i did was just use this rate law or rate equation and plug it in here all right so when m equals to zero let's assume i ran a reaction i figured out the value of m as zero and remember this m is explicitly for a only right that means when m is zero what i say is the reaction is zero order is a zero order with respect to a that makes sense so if m equals to one on the other hand right instead of m being zero if it's one i say the reaction is let me just use this term instead of saying a zero order let's just say is zeroth order so i'm using the adjective with respect to A. When M equals to one, the reaction is first order with respect to A. And trust me, in the next problem that we work, uh, this M and N 
will make more sense. Oh, all this is reaction order is basically just a number and it just tells you how fast a reaction is happening when the M changes, all right? And when M equals to two, we say the reaction is second order with respect to A. Remember, this is a specific, right, reactant, because since M, we're talking about the reactant A, that's why this is with respect to A, with respect to A, with respect to A. Now I could have done the same thing, right? Let's say if N was zero, what I say is the reaction is zeroth order in B because N is explicitly for B only. When N equals to one, I could have said the reaction is first order in B or with respect to B. When N equals to two, it is second order with respect to B. All right, so now let's say I ran an experiment and I figured out both my M and N values and I figured out the M and N values were two and one. So what I say is this reaction is second order in A because the value of M is two and it is first order in B. All right. Now, the other thing that Alex likes to ask you is the overall order of the reaction. What is the overall reaction order? Overall reaction order is basically nothing but the sum of M and N. M and N. So for this reaction, particular reaction, I add these up and I get three. That's why the overall reaction order is third. That's it. So the reaction order for this particular rate law is third overall or is three overall. Okay, I hope this is kind of making sense. And the next problem that I work uh, will hopefully kind of help you think about this M and N that I'm throwing at you, these abstract concepts. So it's the kind of questions that Alex give you, gives you, and we cycle using and understanding the rate law. So they have given us the rate law or the rate equation for a particular reaction. Now remember, the rate law always has only reactants, no products at all. That's why I know that N to N O3 in my reactions are my, both of these are my reactants. Because my couple of slides earlier, what I told you was mathematical expression that describes the relation between the rate of a chemical reaction and the concentration of reactants. We do not really care about the concentration of the product C. That's why I'm telling you since this rate law has N2 and O3, that's how I know that, oh, N2 and O3, are both my reactants. All right, so, okay. Now, let's try to answer these questions. So if a reactant doesn't have any exponent to it, you can just assume it's one, right? Because anything to the power one is the same value, right? To the power one is two, x to the power one is the same number x that's the same thing that's why i just wrote the experiment one for ozone so now the question is asking you what is the reaction order in n2 i go to n2 and i see the value of m as three and that's why the reaction order is three or third however alex wants you to write the answer that means the reaction order is third in nitrogen then question asks us, what is the reaction order in ozone? I go to ozone, it has an exponent of one, that's why it's first order in ozone. Our next question is the overall reaction order. And what did I tell you about the overall reaction order? To find the overall reaction order, you just add the exponents on the two reactants. 
and that gives you the overall reaction order. So I add three plus one, that gives me, sorry, this is one, value of four. So the overall reaction order is four for this particular reaction. All right, now this is what I mean by understanding why are we even doing this, right? Why do we even care about coming up with a rate law? And this is where things are going to get a little bit exciting. And I'm hoping these two problems will help you understand what this really means. So at a certain concentration of N2 and O3, the initial rate of reaction is 3.0 times 10 to the power 3 molars per second. What would the initial rate of the reaction be if the concentration of N2 were doubled? All right, so I do, I might not have enough space here, so I'm going to use my whiteboard for this one. All right, so first I'm going to write down what has been given to me. So the question tells me, at a certain concentration of N2 and O3, the initial rate of the reaction, so the rate has been given to me as 3.0 times 10 to the power 3 molarity per second. Then it's asking me what is the rate. So I'm just gonna let them just call this rate one. Right, rate for experiment number one. And let's just let's call this rate for experiment number two which I do not know because the question is asking me what is would the initial rate of the reaction be if the concentration of N2 were doubled. So for this, what I'm gonna assume is, let's just say N2 had a concentration of X molarity. That means for my rate two thing, N2 is gonna have, since the concentration doubled, the concentration is gonna be two X molarity. Again, remember these are units of molarity. That makes sense. Basically, what it's saying, you telling you is, if N2 was let's say two molar in the first condition, in the second condition it would be two times two as four molar. But then I wrote in terms of x to make my life a little bit easy because I have to solve for x eventually. Sorry, I have to solve for rate eventually. But I hope you understood why I put in x here. Just a variable. All right. Now I'm going to use my rate equation for the first part. So let's just call this the rate first part. This is the second part. For my first part, I'm going to write down my rate that has been given to me. My formula was based on this part of slides. I know that rate equals to k times n2 to the power 3 times the concentration of O3. That's what I'm going to write down. k times n2 third order in nitrogen. And in ozone, it's first order. All right. So for this, I know my rate is 3.0 times 10 to the power 3 molarity per second. Do I know the rate constant? No, they haven't given me the rate constant k. And then n2, because n2 is x to the power. Three. Do I know the concentration of O3? No, I do not know the concentration of O3. All right. Now remember, they whenever they say they double the concentration of N2, we are assuming that the concentration of O3 did not change. So I'm going to leave O3 as the constraints of O3 because I do not know this number, but all I know is the constraints of O3 didn't change, so I'm going to leave it as it is. Now for my second part, I'm going to have rate two. Remember, this is the same reaction and product, so the rate law is going to be the same. Now what else is going to be the same here is basically remember, the rate is the one that is going to change, and which is what we're trying to figure out, but the rate constant stays the same. And that is the importance of this kind of reactions, right? Because rate constant, like the name says it's a constant, it doesn't change. Whenever you 
play around with the concentrations. All right, so based on this, I do not know my rate, so I'm just going to write down rate of two, which is unknown to me, equals to k. I do not know, but I don't care. I'm just going to write down k because I said k is a constant. That's why I didn't change this k and this k value. Now, they told me they doubled the constraints of N2. That's why I have 2x. It was x in my first case. That means it's going to be 2x when you double the concentration. That cube still remains. And we are assuming, and we know that the constraints of O3 did not change. So I'm going to call this my equation number one. I'm going to call this my equation number two. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide equation one by two. So when that happens, right, and it doesn't matter, you could have done the other way as well. Two divided by one doesn't matter. Dividing two divided by one makes my life easy, so I'm going to go that route. So rather than doing one divided by two, I'm going to take the equation number two, and then I'm going to divide it by equation number one. When I do that, this is what I'm going to get, right? I'm going to get rate two equals to k times 2x cubed times the concentration of O3. So that's my equation number two, right? Now I'm going to divide that by equation number one, right? Equation number two divided by one means rate two is going to be divided by this number, 3.0 times 10 to the power three molarity per second. And then the right hand side of the equation is going to divide, going to be divided by this part. K times X cube times O3. Now you might be wondering, oh, but there are too many variables, right? Because whenever you're trying to solve the equation, you can solve the equation one equation if you have one unknown variable. But there's a reason as to why I divided two divided by equation two by equation one was this. So this concentration of O3 that we didn't change cancel out because that is in the numerator, that is in the numerator, everything is multiplying in the numerator, everything is multiplying in the numerator, so we can cancel those two out. And I said rate constant is going to be constant. K and K cancels as out as well, right? Now, you get this 2x to the power cube. That number is going to be 2 times 2 times 2 because it's going to be 2 times cubed. 2 is cubed. That's why 8x cubed divided by x cubed. Now, guess what? I can even cancel out the x cubed and x cubed. That means now all I have are the numbers. And I can do my math. That means my rate 2. When you buy, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 3.0 times 10 to the power 3. That means my answer is going to be 8 times 3.0 times 10 to the power 3. So what is this telling me? All right. So based on this rate law, when the Concentration of N2 is doubled. Look at this. The new rate will be eight times the original rate of this reaction. That's what it's telling me, right? Because since we had a cube here, and that's why I had to cube this two, and that's why I can say that when we double the concentration of nitrogen, the rate, new rate, increased eight times right and this is the beauty of the rate law and when i do my math i'm going to end up with 2.4 times 10 to the power 4 molarity per second so i hope this makes sense right again it looks hard just there is nothing hard about it 
if you work on it, I think you should be you should get a hang of it. Once you work through two or three problems on Alex, I think you'll get a hang of it. Right. In other word, way, what you can do is oh, I can literally I didn't change anything else. All I did was change the construction of n to twice, and that two will be increased to the power of three. That's why it's supposed to be eight times. That's why eight times this original concentration is this. That's probably fine as well. It's up to you. I'm showing all these steps so that you understand this is how I should be conceptualize this problem. And this is why the rate, new rate, is eight times the original rate of the reaction. Or the new reaction where we double the concentration of nitrogen is eight times as faster as the old reaction. So let's just say old for this one. Right, and the new new reaction is eight times faster than the old one. That's all this is telling you. So I hope this makes sense. So let's work the last problem out. So the last problem tells us the rate of the reaction is measured to be 64 molars per second when the concentration of N2 is 1.8 molar and concentration of O3 is 1.4 molar. And then they're asking us to calculate the value of the rate constant. All right. So I do want you to look at those units of K right now for this problem that they're asking us. Do you see how this K has a unit of one to the power negative third times second to the power negative one? Because in the next slide after this, after I work through this problem, we're going to talk about how the unit of rate constant is never the same. We're going to play around with those concepts, unit of rate constant, and very important from exam one point of view. All right, but then for right now, let's figure out the last question. For the last question, I'm going to clear my canvas because this is a All right. So for my last question, what I have been given is the concentration first. The rate has been given to me. The rate of the reaction for that particular reaction. 64.0 molars per second, molarity per second. If you're wondering as to, in the last problem, sorry, the question did tell me to report my answer to two sig fix. If you look at this, round your answer to two sig fix, that's why I wrote my answer as 2.4 times 10 to the power 4 molarity per second. And my constant of N2 equals to 1.8. Not surprisingly, the concentration is molarity, whereas the concentration of ozone is given as 1.4 molarity. Now I'm going to write my rate law that has been given to me. My rate law equals to K times the concentration of N2 to the power third, right? And then ozone to the power one. Look at this. Think about this. Do I know my rate? Check. Do I, know, do I know my rate constant? No, because that is what I'm trying to figure out. Do I know my concentration of nitrogen? Concentration of nitrogen, check. Do I know the concentration of ozone? Check. That means a mathematical expression with only one unknown, right? That means I can solve this out. Let's start plugging in the values. The rate has been given to me as 64.0 molars per second. My rate question is something I'm trying to figure out. And then what I'm going to do is right, when I'm right, right now here, I'm going to show you as to how they got the unit, right? Because remember, in the question, they had their rate constant unit as molar to the power negative 3 times second to the power negative 1. So let's go ahead and see as well uh, as to why the unit of the rate constant came to be this. All right, so we're gonna see it here. Really cool. All right, and then again, if this doesn't make sense, in the next slide we're gonna go to go work on a couple of problem on the units for rate constant. So now N2 has been given to me as 1.8 molar, but then this all value has been cubed. Ozone has to be given me uh, the value of ozone. Concentration of ozone is 1.4 molar. And this is to the power one as well. All right. So I'm going to do my math. 
So I'm gonna get 64.0 molarity per second equals to K. So if I do all this part, let me go ahead and do it in my calculator. Let me my So 1.8 to the power 3. This value, 1.8 to the power 3, gives me 5.832. But remember, this molar is being cubed as well. So I'm just going to write to make my life easy. I'm just going to write down molar cubed here. That's outside the bracket. And times. 1.4 this molar to the power one is molarity as well while i'm here let me go ahead and cancel the since all these are being multiplied right so i can definitely cancel the molarity here one molarity and one molarity here right so my k value is going to be This is to the math first, right? So all I have to do is 64 divided by 5.832 times 1.4. My K value is going to be 7.8 in two sig figs. But what about the unit? How the heck did they get this here? So if I divide both sides of the equation by M cube, what do you think happens? Right? Don't you get something like meter cube times second in the denominator. And guess what? Isn't this the same as 7.8? Remember, one divided by x cube in its exponent form is the same as x to the power negative third, right? And the one is one divided by y is the same as y to the power negative one. And that's how they got this, right? m to the power negative third times second to the power negative one. That's how they got their units here. Again, for this problem, you didn't have to worry about the units, but in the following slides, we're gonna talk about the unit of rate constant. So I start, I'll give you a test of what it looks like. But in here, all you had to do was calculate the value of the rate constant, which you did as 7.8. That's the value of the rate constant for that particular reaction under these conditions. And again, take your time. I want you to look at this and then see if you understood how they played around or how did they get the units this. As meter to the sorry, molarity to the power negative third times second to the power negative one, because that's where we're going to go next. The next thing that we're going to look at is the unit of rate constant. Before that, there's going to be a knowledge check four problem. So, this problem asks you for the same problem in the earlier slides. So, it is talking about this problem, All right? Then what I'm telling you is, what is the new value of the rate constant? So I want you to focus on this problem. So basically you are solving this problem, but I have changed, tweaked things a little bit. I'm telling you that what is the new value of the rate constant if the reaction order in nitrogen was two instead of three? Because if you look at the rate law, you see how this is reaction order is third in nitrogen, but then what I'm asking you to do is find the rate constant when it is reaction order is two in terms of nitrogen. I hope this makes sense and assume everything else is constant. So basically, so I'm gonna kind of give you a hint here rather right? than your rate law being something as K nitrogen to the power three to the power one i'm asking you for this last problem keep everything the same but in this reaction order from 
3 to 2 then find the rate constant that is all i'm asking you to do and then while you are here to push yourself further right see if you can figure out what happens to the unit of rate constant see if you can figure out that the unit for rate constant is going to change to this and see if you understand as to how that's happening so i give you the answer not the the answer not the rate constant but i give the unit of the rate constant what i'm asking you to do is solve the value of the new rate constant and you'll get full credit on e campus but then go further and see if you can figure it out as to how the unit of rate constant for this particular problem when the reaction order is second in nitrogen is molarity to the power negative two times second to the power negative one right so now as promised let's talk about the unit of rate constant so uh, let's look at this question an experiment shows that the reaction of nitrogen dioxide with carbon monoxide is second order in NO2 so let me do not even look at this right so let's try and see if you can figure out how to write down the rate law right so just based on this language so when I write down the rate law the way I'm going to write down is rate right how fast slow is the reaction happening equals to the reaction rate constant reaction rate constant k times the concentration of NO2 times since the NO2 and the other reaction is carbon dioxide monoxide the concentration of CO because my reaction is nitrogen dioxide NO2 is reacting with carbon monoxide and we said rate law all it says is relates the rate with the concentration of reactants it relates the rate with the concentration of reactants but remember we have to worry about the order of the reaction what its question tells me is second order in no2 so guess what i should write a second order exponent of two for no2 and it says zero order in carbon monoxide. So I'm going to write down zero order in carbon monoxide. Right? You might be wondering what the heck is that zero order? And in math, in for experience, you might have learned anything. Let's say x to the power zero or hundred to the power zero or a million to the power zero is always one. That's why this part right here is going to have a value of one. That's why you rate is going to be k times no2 to the power 2. now what i'm asking you to do focus is on what is the what would be the unit of rate constant k for this reaction so i have my rate law since this co has already vanished because of this is a, has a value of one we wouldn't have to worry about that All right. All right. So now let's see if we can figure this out. The rate constant for this reaction, for this particular reaction. All right. So I'm going to open my white board. So my goal is I'm trying to figure out my unit for rate constant. which is second order in NO2 and then zero order in carbon monoxide. Zero order means we're assuming it doesn't exist. That's why I've just left it here. All right, now let's go down the memory lane, right? What did we say the unit for reaction rate was yesterday, right? What we're saying is change in concentration over change in time. That's the unit for rate, right? So what I can do is I can write this rate as molarity, change in concentration over seconds and change in time. Let's assume that the, the reaction was monitored in seconds. So I hope this part makes sense. Equals to, I'm trying to figure out the 
a unit for k, right? Which I do not know, so I'm just gonna write down k. The unit is unknown to me. Times, what is the unit for the concentration of NO2? Always going to have molarity, right? To the power two. And look at that, all I have to do is like move around M and, and I get my answer, right? So I'm gonna divide both sides by M square. Both sides of the equation by m square, then this is what I get. Molarity divided by seconds times one divided by m square equals to k times m square divided by m square. When I do that, what's this? I can cancel out my metric square and metric square. Sorry, <laughs> the molarity square and molarity square. And then, since m square is m times m, I can cancel one of the m's out, right? That is my final concentration of k is going to be one divided by molarity times second. Or it's the same as Molarity to the power negative one times second to the power negative one. That means the final unit of rate constant K for this reaction, which is second order in NO2, is going to be this or this, whichever is fine. But I'll be comfortable denoting both ways because let's say in a multiple choice question, if this choice was given to you and then you are used to this, and that might hurt you. So make sure you're comfortable understanding both of these choices. Right? So again, what I'm doing here, right, is basically think about this, right? If you think about uh, all these equations that you'll be used. So what I mean by that is, let's say, easy example. Okay, my canvas. Uh, what comes to my mind? Uh, uh, let's just say, oh yeah, easy example might be, let's say PV equals to NRT. Right? So how do you think they came up with the unit for R? Like you're like, ah, that's a gas constant. I do not know the units for R, right? What you can do is, what's this, right? You know that pressure is measured in ATM. Volume is in usually in liters. My N is the number of moles, and I'm trying to figure out the unit for gas constants R times temperature is in Kelvin, right? Now, all I have to do is divide both sides of the equation by mole times Kelvin. When I do that, what's going to happen? Divide both sides by mole times Kelvin, mole times R times Kelvin, divided by moles times Kelvin. And look at this. Mole and mole cancels. Kelvin and Kelvin cancels. Not the rate constant, this is capital K, all right? Capital K refers to the Kelvin, whereas small k refers to the rate constant. And then that's why the final unit for gas constants are, one of the final units is liter times ATM, I just switched places for these two, all right? Times small Kelvin. That's it. And that's how you derive units, right? For some of the unknowns of some of the constants, right? And this can be even written as liter ATM times, you can even write it as mole to the power negative one times Kelvin to the power negative one. So I hope what I did with the unit of rate constant makes sense. That will definitely be uh, in your exam one in some shape or form for the units of rate constant. So make sure you're comfortable with that concept. All right, so moving on. So your knowledge check five is gonna ask you the rate constant of K for the reaction in the earlier slide. So it's talking about this reaction. if the reaction was first order in carbon monoxide and everything else is constant. 
to make your life easy. What is it telling you is now the read law tells me that it is in anno it was second order, right? In anno two, sorry, nitrogen dioxide is a second order. Next of carbon monoxide being zero order in carbon monoxide, I'm telling you, use this. Let's assume that it was first order in carbon monoxide. Then I'm asking you, what is the unit for the rate constant? This is what I went through with all this and in the Microsoft whiteboard. I hope this isn't that bad. I've kind of given you the hint and this is the best hint I can give you without giving up all the answers. All right, so now, you might be wondering as to how scientists determine the reaction rate law, right? Because we said that for reaction A plus B going to C, we said that rate equals to rate constant times A to the power M and B to the power N. And we made a point, right? That M and N has nothing to do with the coefficient in front of A and B and C. That means balancing a reaction does not tell you anything about m and n all right that means you have to solve the value of m and n by running an experiment and this is how the chemist runs an experiment all right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to read some of the sentences but i'm going to show you this is how the chemist culture the data and hopefully it will make sense all right so the first thing um, we, First thing, this is kind of like think about the broad picture. So we measure the or we find the rate law of the reaction by measuring the initial rate. That means we must measure the rate of the reaction. All right, to come up with everything, to figure out the value of K, to figure out the value of M, to figure out the value of N, we need to first measure the initial rate of the reaction. And when I say initial rate, I'm talking about the rate at time equals to zero. Then what I'm going to do is that initial rate, I'm not just going to measure it once, I'm going to measure three to four times, depending upon how many reactants I have, right? Then I'm going to measure the rate by playing around with different initial concentrations of reactant. So again, to kind of put this further, so let's look at this. Hopefully this will make sense. Okay, so this is what, it says this is how we define the rate law. All right, so first it says the order. So basically if you're trying to find the M and N values, it says can be determined by varying its initial concentration while holding the initial concentration of the other reactant constant. So what's this? So let's look at this problem. And if you look at these two, so I'm just going to call this experiment number one. I'm going to call this experiment number two. I'm going to call this experiment number three. So if you look at experiment one and two, concentration of nitrogen gas. Do you see what the chemist did? So what the chemist did was, see, so there's a reaction, right? So let's just say the since this is going to be a reactant, we are looking at, most probably looking at the Haber's process, so N2 plus H2 going to NH3. All right, so I balance this reaction to nitrogen 2, nitrogen 3, 6, 3. Right? So I'm trying to find the rate law for this reactants. That's why you see this nitrogen and hydrogen gas over here. So going back, what it told me was the order with respect to the reaction can be determined by varying the initial concentration of one of the reactant while holding the concentration of the other reactant constant and look at that right for this they held the concentration of nitrogen constant while they varied concentration of hydrogen because from these experiment one and two that will help the chemist to determine the reaction order in terms of hydrogen and this is what what we're going to work next i'm going to solve this problem out but then i'm just trying to make sure you understand all these verbiage that are thrown out there all right 
Now, okay, fine and dandy. It helped me figure out the concentration, I mean, reaction order with respect to H2, right? But you might be wondering, how the heck do I find the reaction order in terms of N2 then? Same thing. Let's look at experiment number one and three and see what the chemist did. In experiment one and experiment three, what they did was they kept the concentration of hydrogen constant now. This is how the concentration of hydrogen is 1.32 molar in both experiment one and three. But look at the concentration of nitrogen. They played around with it. They changed the concentration of nitrogen. Look at this. Now, based on experiment one and three, we can figure out the reaction order with respect to nitrogen. And after we find the reaction order, we can literally just use one of these experiments because we have the initial rate, we have the reaction order, then we can find the rate constant K. Right? So remember, whenever we say the rate law, the rate law is basically if you know your K, the value of M, the value of N, that's your rate law, right? So with all this experiment, we're trying to figure out the value of K, the rate constant, we're trying to figure out the value of M, the reaction order with respect to nitrogen, and the value of N, the reaction order with respect to hydrogen gas. All right, so this is what this verbiage is telling you. That's all. Same thing over here. All this verbiage is basically telling you about how the chemist collected this data. All right, now let's just go to the next step and let's figure out how we can use this data to find the reaction orders and then the reaction rate constant. So we can write down the rate law for this reaction. All right, so let's start it. And I'm not going to have the space here, so I'm just going to use my whiteboard, my sub whiteboard for this problem. And again, if I were you, what I would do is I would open this in one other screen, I don't know, maybe in a phone or somewhere, and then uh, look at my work as I'm working through it on, on the screen. That way you are able to see the both the questions and then solve what, how I solve at the same time. All right, so now, all right, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna look at my first reaction and write down the rate law. So what I'm gonna, what I've been telling you is, my the first one is where my cursor is at. I'm gonna call this one as my experiment one. The second one, as experiment two, all these values, and the third one is my experimental three, experiment three. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at my experiment one and experiment two data. From my first experiment data, what I can do is I'm gonna call that rate one equals to rate constant k and one thing that you have to sorry i forgot to mention right is basically since this reaction that i'm talking about is just talking about nitrogen and hydrogen and i didn't mess around with the temperature the reaction sorry the rate constant will be the same for all these experiment one experiment two and experiment three the reaction rate constant small k value will be the same All right, so based on that, I write down for my first one, my rate one is going to be K times N2 to the power M to the power H2 to the power N, because I don't know my values for this. That means my rate for reaction one has been given to me as 0 0.899 molarity per second equals to K times the value of the concentration of N2 in my experiment one is 0 0.434. Value of H2 in my experiment one, the concentration of H2 is 1.32 to the power N. 
I'm going to do the same thing with experiment two. Right? So I'm just going to go ahead and write down directly my rate expression and the values. All right. In my experiment two, my rate two is going to be 3.75 equals to, I said, uh, rate constant is going to be the same. The concentration of nitrogen is going to be, for my experiment number two, it's 5.0.434. Sorry, 0 0.434. That's the concentration of nitrogen gas to the power m. And remember, this reaction order with respect to nitrogen and hydrogen, they still the same, even if I change the concentration of both nitrogen and hydrogen. And then the concentration of hydrogen was 5.51 to the power n. So I'm going to call this my this as my equation one, this as my equation two. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to divide equation one by equation two, right? So when I do that, divide equation one by equation two, I get something like this: 0 0.899 divided by the left hand side of the equation, 3.75 equals to the right-hand side of the equation, this, k times 0 0.434 to the power m, 1.32 to the power n, and then the right-hand side of the equation over here. So k times 0 0.434 to the power m, and then 5.51 to the power n. Now, something that you have noticed is one of the reasons the chemists keep once the concentration constant is what's this? So you can cancel these out, right? Anything to the power m. If they are the same numbers, I can cancel these two out, right? 0 0.434 to the power m can be canceled with the 0 0.434 to the power m in the denominator. And my k and k gets canceled as well. That means the only unknown in this reaction is n. So when I do this math, I'm going to get 0. 2397 equals to 0 0.239 to the power n. If you're wondering as to how I got the number 0 0.239, right? In math, this is the same as me writing as 1.32 divided by 5.51 to the power n. And whenever I divide these two numbers, I get the value 0 0.239 to the power n. Right? So that means to figure out the value of n, all I can do is this is to the power one, right? It's the same as this number. That tells you the value of n has to be one because do you see how these two numbers are the same? That means the value of n has to be one. And look at that. I just solved the reaction order of hydrogen in the reaction, right? It tells me that the reaction order is first in hydrogen right so i hope this is making sense now i'm going to do the same thing all right so something that you should have realized that the reason i took experiment one and two and let's say i didn't use experiment two and three to find me the value of n right here is because in experiment one and two, the concentration of N2, they were constant. You see how this was constant? Do you see how this was constant? And that's why to find the reaction order of hydrogen, I had to use the two experiments where the other reactant has a constant concentration. That's why I used experiment one and two to find me the reaction order hydrogen in the reaction. All right. So based on that concept, I'm going to clear the canvas now. To find me the value of M, what I do is I'm going to take experiment or one and three. Same thing, right? I'm going to take experiment one and experiment three. 
and I'm going to do the same thing what I just did. For my experiment one, my rate is going to be, I'm going to save some time because I've already solved this for experiment number one. It was 0 0.899 equals to k to the power n2 to the power m h2 to the power n, right? 0 0.899 equals to k. My value of n2 in experiment one was 0 0.434 molar to the power m times hydrogen was 1.32 molar to the power n. Then I'm going to go to my experiment three, do the same thing, right? So my rate for experiment three is 2.37. equals to k times concentration of nitrogen in experiment three is 0 0.704 to the power m. The concentration of hydrogen is 1.32 and what's this, right? And the reason I took experiment one and three is going to be circled in blue, what's this? Because you see how this concentration of H2 is constant, that's why. I use experiment one and three because that will help me find the reaction order M, value of M. Now I'm gonna divide this equation by this equation. Let's call this equation number three. Let me just call this equation number four. So I'm gonna divide three divided by four. And I'm gonna get the number 0 0.899 divided by 2.37 equals to k times 0 0.434 to the power m times 1.32 to the power n divided by k times 0 0.704 to the power m 1.32 to the power n and what's this this is why we took experiment one and experiment three you can cancel out these n values Right, the K and K gets cancelled. And if you saw do the same thing what I did earlier, your M value will come to two. That means based on that, I can write down my rate as rate equals to K times N2 to the power two, right? Because this M value was for nitrogen. And then my n value that I solved for earlier is the value of one. And that's what the first question that asks you, Alex asks you, is to write down the rate law for this reaction. And this is how you're supposed to write down the rate law for this reaction after you figure out the value of m and n. Now, second part of the question, what it asks you is to figure out the value of constant k so for that what i'm going to do is and i can take any equation i can take equation number one equation number two equation number three that i had solved it doesn't matter all right so either experiment one experiment two experiment three so in my experiment one what I had was my rate law was 0 0.899 equals to k times 0 0.434 to the power m times 1.32 to the power n, right? Again, this number, I got it from experiment number one because experiment number one tells me that this is the concentration of nitrogen. This is the concentration of hydrogen that they used, and this is the initial rate. And now I know my values of M and N, right? So let me plug those numbers in. That means, let me just save my time. I know the value of M that I solved was, M was two, and the value of N that I solved was one. Look at that. Now this is equation where everything is known except for my rate constant K. Now I can solve my rate constant K. My rate constant k is going to look like something like 0 0.899 divided by 0 0.434 whole square times 1.32 to the power 1, which is the same as that. And in the end, my value is going to be 3.62.
Okay, it's up to you. Right now, Alex doesn't ask you to put in any in any units for rate constant. Take your time. See if you can figure out what the unit for rate constant is, just so that you know that you're comfortable with this concept. All right. So again, I spend a lot of time on this. So your knowledge check six. goes to the same concept. First, it asks, it gives you the same kind of data or the way it's put in is the same, right? Look at that, it has trial one, so similar to how I had used the term experiment one, experiment two, experiment three. It has concentration of one of the reactant, concentration of another reactant, and then the rate of the reaction. Look at the one same right the way they have put in here as for concentration of one of the reactant concentration of another reactant and then the rate of the reaction and all you have to do is follow the same steps that i did and this will be a good practice for you and then you'll have to figure out the what is the rate law what is the rate constant k and then overall rate of this reaction So can you change that over, I will rewrite the word, change that uh, rate to overall order of this reaction. Sorry, change this to, I'm hoping, I'm gonna check on uh, eCampus to make sure I didn't use that to, term, because I do not really remember uh, on eCampus what did I ask you to solve, but then I'm gonna check on that. So that number C should say overall order for this reaction, not the rate, all right? So again, C should say overall order of the reaction. So by that, what I mean is for this reaction, our M value was, it was rate equals to K times N2 was M and then what's the other reactant? H2 was N, right? And we solved the value of M as two, N as one. That means the overall order of the reaction is M plus N, two plus one equals to three. That's what I'm trying to ask for this overall order of the reaction, not rate. So please fix that. So I'm gonna look into eCampus as well, and then I'm gonna change that. If that is an issue. All right. So again, I have been doing lots of math, lots of constitutional stops. Take your time, and that's what I've been asking you to start LX homework early. First thing you should have realized that this is a summer session. What I'm trying to teach you, it usually gets start in a two week frame. What I'm trying to finish kinetics in like four days. So keep that in mind. We're trying to jam in so much information in a short period of time, that's why Take the challenge if you have registered for the summer classes. I'm assuming you are ready to take the challenge and then start on your Alex homework right away on Monday. Do not wait till like Saturday or Sunday. Trust me, all these concepts is are going to overwhelm you. You are going to get frustrated. So Alex will be more like a frustrating experience for you rather than a learning experience. And keep that in mind, right? In your rate lock person, we don't really care about our product. So that's why if you look at the concentration, they have given only the concentration of the reactants. Same thing over here. That's why I told you that nitrogen and hydrogen were the reactants. All right, so last thing that I'm gonna talk about today is something called integrated rate law. And this is another kind of like, um, I, would say, I wouldn't say really abstract concepts, but your understanding of math, equation, why intercept and all those things is very necessary for you to kind of think through all this concept for the integrated rate law. All right, so what is integrated rate law? So if you think about this, right? So, so far what we have talked about, the rate law that we have written down, the instantaneous rate, the average reaction rate, what we have talked about is the relation between 
the concentration of either reactants or products and the rate. Those are the only two relationships that we have kind of explored so far, right? For example, what I mean by that is, look at this, you compared rate and how it relates to the concentration, right? So this is the rate law for this reaction. So you have looked at the concentration because rate is basically the concentration, right? Sorry, rate and then the concentration of this reactant. All right, so now if I take that rate law and if I integrate it, and I would say not only respect to time, it's going to be more, and I'm going to talk about that. And it's up to you if you want to understand it into much more detail. I'm just going to show you as to how the integration works. All right, but the reason that I'm going to show you is basically how the rate law can be integrated and then produce a concentration and time relationship rather than the concentration and rate relationship that we have talked about so far All right and then relationship depends on upon whether the reaction is zero order similar right think about this zero order as let's see if i have a reaction where my m value was zero i know that this reaction is zero order right because the m value is zero first order means when m equals second order is when m equals two and so on and finally based on the integrated rate law i'm going to talk about half-life first talk to you as to what half-life means conceptually then we're going to work through some problems all right so let me tell you what i mean by this integration with respect to something right so this shouldn't be just time it should be more than time but let's just say the rate law can be integrated for right now so cancel this out Rate law. Yeah, we're going to use time to integrate, but there is some more we're going to integrate, like in terms of concentration as well. So I don't, I just don't want you to get that wrong conceptually. What I mean by this integration, what's this? So if the reaction is first, let's see if I have a react, reaction where A is going to be, right? So B is the product, but then when I write the rate law, I write down something like this because rate law goes to k times a to the power m, right? But let's assume that m is 1. Boom. Guess what? This is my first order reaction, right? Because m is 1, and that's the only reactant that is taking part in this reaction. That's why I can say that this right here is my first order reaction, right? a to the power 1 is a. That's why my rate is going to be ka. Now, Again, what's this? And this is the part, it's up to you. If you want to understand in detail, it's up to you, but I don't really require it. If you are taking calculus class, this might be something interesting to you. So I'm just going to show it to you, all right? All right, so for the rate, we have defined this rate as change in concentration of A divided by change in time. Remember, this is the same as delta A divided by delta T. Right. Let's just say equivalent. I should say same because you might come back and <laughs> scream at me as to in calculus a different. But let's just say these are equivalent for right now. That's my rate value right here. I change that to dA over dt. So change of a and change of time. Right. Constant of a change in time, but then very very minuscule change is what d tells you. All right. And my ka, I'm going to keep it constant, not change it yet. So I'm going to multiply both of this equation by dt. So what I get is something like dA equals to k times dt times concentration of A. So to kind of put the like sum on the same side, I'm going to divide both sides by the concentration of A. When I do that, I'm going to get something like this. Small k, not capital K, all right, dt. And now, when I integrate this, all right, when I integrate this 
since on my left hand side I'm talking about the concentration of A from time when A was zero concentration all the way to concentration of A at time T. On my right hand side, since A is a constant, so what I'm going to do is that DT is talking about time. That means I'm integrating this from time equals to zero, right? To time T. And when I integrate this all, guess what do I get? My first order reaction, integrated rate law. And again, like I told you, this is for if you're taking calculus, this might make sense to you, all right? As to how I integrate, why I integrate that way. You don't have to understand this for people who are taking calculus and try to, who wants to, who want, who wants to push themselves further, look at it and hopefully this will make sense. Go ahead and do the integration and hopefully you'll get the same answer. Right, and something that I missed, really, really important, is remember for our rate when we talked about this, right? Since the reacts A is the reactant, remember we said we have to put the negative sign, and which I almost forgot, right? Because we said that since the concentration of A, which is the reactant, decreases over time, and since rate is a positive value, that's why I put the negative sign here. So this is basically negative D over T D. So we are integrating more like negative dA over A, over A naught through AT, and same as from here, zero through time T. And when I integrate this, what I get is, this is the most important part, is this. So this is the first order integrated rate law. Really, really important because that's what I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes that we have left, all right? So let's look at that formula. And again, like I told you, this is optional. You don't have to understand all this. If you want to, go ahead and do it. Be my guest. Otherwise, all you have to do is understand this part. So let me just erase this. That way I can focus on, right? Understand that why this is forced order reaction. And then if I integrate, do some integration, not just respect to time, just respect to time and maybe add the term concentration if you want to. Gives me this. So whatever I circled or squared in red are the two important things that you need. All right, now let us define these terms. Most of these we are comfortable with, right? A is the rate constant, same rate constant that we've been talking about in our earlier slides, same rate constant K, same rate constant K that we use for our rate law of P. And this is why we use the rate law, right? Because we're trying to figure out what is the relation between concentration versus time, right? Because that was our goal, right? Because bullet point tells us that the integrated rate law helps us figure out the relation between concentration and time and that's why this t small t is time and you have no no two new terms a naught and a t right so when i say i a naught i'm talking about this term and a at time t so what are these terms a naught means the concentration of the reactant at time equals to zero. So think about that as the initial concentration of A. And that T, the A subscript T tells you what is the concentration of reactant A at time T. All right, so I hope this is kind of making sense. I do understand there's lots of math again, and I told you not to focus on the calculus part integration. All you have to do is understand this conceptually and internalize the fact that this is reaction. This expression tells us that this is first order in A, and whenever I integrate this part with respect to constraints and time, I get this equation. And this equation is what we are interested in. We're interested in exploiting this equation all right and then make sure you know what is a naught this term what does a at times means all 
All right, so now that equation right here, same equation that you see here, I can rephrase it. The way I'm going to phrase it was this. I'm going to take this. So my natural log rule, what it tells me is ln of x divided by y equals to ln of x minus natural log of y. Ln means natural log. All right, so that's what sorry, I should have even told you here. So this Ln that you see here is the natural log here. All right. So based on that, what I can write this equation as Ln of a naught minus Ln of a t equals to k t. Right, and whenever I rephrase this, guess what? This is the equation that I get. You might be wondering why the heck do we have to go through all that? All right, is because this is on the important part of this slide, really important part. So basically what this tells you. So let me put this equation that you have here in blue. in the y equals to mx form, right? Where my y is my natural log concentration of A, my y axis, whereas my x axis is the time, which is T, right? Now what's this? So this is my y, y equals to m times x remember my x axis has time in there that's why do you see how this time aligns with my x right since my y axis has ln of a do you see how this y aligns with ln of a and plus c because you know that we know that y equals to mx plus c is the equation of a straight line that C right there is talking about the Y intercept. So what it means is basically, let's see if I draw a line here, a straight line, and draw it in red. All right. That equation line right there in red is basically the equation of this line. All right, now my C is the Y intercept, meaning that this right here is my Y intercept. So the distance between this and this on the Y axis, that's my Y intercept. And something that I did intentionally is, do you see how that K, which is the rate constant, remember that, has a negative value in front of me? That tells me that, right? Since that K value has to be a positive number, that's why it tells me that my slope is negative. That's why I drew the line in that way rather than, let's say, this way, right? Because if I draw the line this way, this line right here has a positive slope, whereas the red line that I drew here has a negative slope. That's why you have the minus sign here. All right, so to paraphrase what I mean by all this, all right, is the ln A T is plotted on the Y axis. That's why I have the ln of the concentration of A. This T is just telling you the concentration of A at different times T, all right? And my X axis, I have the time. Look at my second bullet point. It says time T is plotted on the X axis. Look at the slope of the line. That's negative k right that's why my m aligns with negative k and finally the y intercept value look at that my y intercept value should be ln of a naught the y intercept value c is ln of the initial concentration of a naught will give me the y intercept value all 
All right, so I hope this makes sense. So to kind of help you think through this, this is your knowledge check seven. I'm asking you for the linear form, form of first order integrated rate law because all these examples that I gave you, right? These two slides, these are for first order reactions. That means they're talking about the first order integrated rate law. I'm asking you for the linear form of first order integrated rate law. What is plotted in the y axis? Look at that. Your answer is all over here. So if you watch this recorded video, I hope you are able to answer this because your answer, I've just literally pointed you to the answer for this question. What is plotted on the x axis? And it's also asking you what is the slope of this linear form? All right, remember that k right here in that equation, k is the the rate constant, All right? So I'm gonna work through one problem really quick for the integrated rate law. Or maybe I think I'm gonna stop here because I think it's already been like one hour, 30 minutes and I don't want to overwhelm you guys because I do know I've been throwing a lot of abstract concepts at you. And again, take some time to internalize this. Otherwise exam one is gonna be really, really hard for you. Make sure you understand this rate law. What does this mean? How did I get from here to here? What's plotted in the y-axis? What's plotted in the x-axis? What does the slope of the line tells me? And such. So I'm going to stop here. I hope you'll have a good day. Stay cool because the temperature is going to be around like, I don't know, 90 something for the next week or so. And stay safe.